Hello and welcome to DTV, your source for news and information about the Knox County Democratic Party. I'm Michael Davis and joining me today are Charles Chandler and Bill Owen of the local Democratic Party. And we're very happy to have everybody here today. What we're going to be doing is discussing uh, the momentous election that we are all still currently experiencing two days after November 3rd. Uh, and uh, just a note to viewers, it is November 5th at 8.10 p.m. Please forgive any outbursts of emotional reactions that we might experience over the course of this program because things are still uh, being counted up and results are coming in fast and furious in several key swing states. And uh, we just might get some big news that we, uh, that we want to uh, talk about during the show. But uh, that's the, uh, the joy of recorded TV, I guess. It'll, it'll be a delayed reaction, but it'll be fun. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about just starting here on the local level right here in Knox County. We had a slew of super talented, hardworking Democratic candidates, uh, but unfortunately did not see the, the seats that we would like uh, to have been won, but we did see gains in, in our own rights. Um, so I'm just going to open the floor up to, uh, to y'all, Charles and Bill. Tell us what your takeaways and thoughts were on the local elections. Well, certainly locally, uh, this was uh, a unique election. Hmm. Uh, looking at the numbers, looking at the number of registered voters, uh, looking at the number of registered voters who actually voted, uh, and looking at uh, all the top secret data information that we've got, uh, you know, in terms of which way we think they, they lean by putting them through the big data machine, almost every single Republican in Knox County voted. I mean, <laughs> you, uh, that, that is not an easy thing to overcome. Um, uh, about somewhere between 75 to uh, 85, maybe even nine, uh, 89% of the Democrats in Knox County voted. Uh, so that's that's not a bad thing. Uh, we, we did good work. If we had not done the work that we'd done, uh, you'd be seeing 70-30 uh, you know, splits uh, rather than the 65-33 uh, uh, splits. Um, uh, and uh, overall, it was 56-41 uh, to 41 for the top of the ticket for Joe and Kamala. Uh, so we worked hard. Uh, it was just um, a really unique year. Yeah. It's been an extremely unique year. And here locally, um, you know, we do have, we, we had some excellent, excellent candidates. We, we, first of all, we want to say congratulations to Sam McKenzie and Gloria Johnson for their wins and their outstanding races and, and the leadership that they will be showing in the Tennessee State House. Uh, Sam is, will be a new state representative, but he has uh, served on county commission. Uh, he is a, a quality guy, and uh, I think we'll be hearing lots and lots from Sam McKenzie. Gloria yeah. Johnson has done an outstanding job as state representative. She, she ran a, a good race and, you know, she had a, a quality opponent uh, and uh, won going away. So, you know, Gloria's been up and down in, in politics like a lot of us have, but uh, she's on the upswing and uh, uh, has certainly developed a strong following. So we had a, really, we had a good election and a, and a very unique year, uh, as we pointed out. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, something we have to, to, to be aware of just locally uh, on the tennis level of the Tennessee and of the nation, you know, there are a lot of Americans who think that uh, the concerns about COVID-19 are overwrought or made up. Uh, they think that the environmental uh, concerns with uh, climate change uh, are, are not something we should be worried about. They don't even think Social Security should be a, thing, a thing, and you can see that in how they voted. Uh, there's some anecdotes that exist that say that even when they're personally affected by these things, they're not changing their mind. Right. And so we have to, to take that into account. There are uh, a significant number of our neighbors and our country people who have a fundamentally different set of values, a different way 
of interpreting information than we do. Um, and we're probably not going to change that uh, even in a couple of years. Uh, and so we have to figure out what we're going to do to be working with that. That's true, but we, we, we need to be talking about these issues like Social Security, like Medicare, like uh, Medicaid expansion. We need to be talking about these issues every day. Uh, many of us who are already on Medicare uh, certainly benefit from it and enjoy that we're on Medicare. Uh, I don't know anyone who's on Medicare who doesn't enjoy it. And uh, Medicare for all would be, would be uh, substantially better than what we have right now. Right. Single payer would be better. Right. Joe Biden's plan is to lower Medicare uh, from 65 eligibility from 65 to 60. Um, I'd like to see it. The Mike Cornell plan uh, was that, or is, that we lower the age eligibility for Medicare one year every year for the next 25 or 30 years. So instead of 60, lowering it to 60, then the next year it'd be 59, the next year it'd be 58, the next year it'd be 57, so and so forth. So that's that's one plan that Mike Cornell came up with 20 years ago and people didn't embrace it, but I, I think that's a that would be a good uh, alternative. A thing I haven't figured out about all of this is why so many people, uh, including business owners, really want to be in the business of keeping people healthy. I mean, I, if I was a business owner uh, and, and the business is, I want to be focused on whatever it is my goal is, providing goods and services to people in exchange for money. I don't want to have to be providing social services. I don't understand what this this fixation Right. Um, the, and the the uh, the killer that that is for job mobility, and not to branch too much into this, is a very national sort of idea. Like that, your your job, your healthcare isn't portable with you. Like it's only tied to your job. That's kind of a crazy thing in limiting people to to being able to go to freely switch from a job that they might that might be economically bad for them just because they have fear of not being covered for their health. Something that's so crucial to them, especially nowadays. Aren't we the only country in the world that does it this way? I, I don't know if we're the only one, but we we shouldn't we're, be among that number. One of, if not, we're one of the few. Not Most countries uh, cover, certainly the uh, advanced Western countries, yes. cover people. Uh, they have universal care. Stinks and, for and it costs less than, what, than our health care does. It, it stinks for everybody. Uh, because, you know, the, the employers have to deal with it. Uh, the employees have to deal with it. It's a demotivator all around. Uh, it's just not good business. Right. Uh, and I don't the, understand. The, the, Joe know, Biden, uh, the Joe Biden plan is to have, uh, have an, uh, an option, a public health option. Yeah. And I think that's a, a you know, we're all going to get behind. We're all, we all are on the, the DNC has endorsed that. Uh, we're, we're all behind, uh, uh, the Joe Biden plan. Okay. Let's steer a little bit back toward some of our local races here and discuss right. what just happened. We, uh, we've, we've, we've highlighted our two uh, state house wins there. That's great to see Gloria Johnson come away, especially with the margins that she did in a, in like what you were pointing out there, Charles, in a year when we saw a, just a huge uh, surge of Republican voters in Knox County for her to still turn out the kind of number she did. That's a huge feat. And she she went away, she walked away with a comfortable win. Uh, Sam McKenzie, uh, of course, you know the, his district is has been v leaned very Democratic for years now, so no one was surprised. But it, it's great to see that that seat is held up. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of these other close uh, races that we had. Uh, probably the closer one, uh, closest one was the the Manis v. Couch race there out in West Knoxville. Let's talk about that one a little bit. The margins were pretty close there. I was really hopeful that Virginia was going to be able to pull that one out, but I think, was it just Manis's name recognition? Was it that wave of Republican voters? What do we see happening in that race? There, I think there's, a, there's at least two things that, that happened there. Um, one, uh, not all the Democrats turned out. Democrats uh, in Knox County and Tennessee um, don't vote. 
when you look at the numbers, so one, one of the things that we got from the, this election, we actually have a pretty good idea of how many Republicans there are uh, and a pretty good idea of how many Democrats there are uh, because of all the big data stuff that we do. Um, if all the Democrats in State House 18 had turned out and voted for Virginia Couch, she would have won. Hmm. Uh, another thing that we see looking at these things is Biden had more votes uh, than Virginia Couch. Yeah. Uh, and in ways that it's not that some people were only voting at the top of the ticket. Uh, it's clear that there's people who are voting for Biden that were not voting, uh, that were voting the, for the Republicans down the ticket. No. And does that tie to Manus as a candidate? I think it ties to something uh, else, honestly, because there was a similar pattern in 2018. Really? Uh, with Bill Lee and Marsha Blackburn. Uh, there were Republicans uh, voting for Bill Lee uh, that were then voting for Bredesen. Um, and it might be that Bredesen was just a really, really great guy. Uh, but there's something that Marsha Blackburn and Virginia Couch and Jamie Bollinger, they all have in common, and they all have the same pattern. And I think, uh, Bill, you, you might have mentioned an anecdote that sort of illustrates that earlier when we were talking about pregame. I don't know if you want to get into that right now. Well, There's no, re no reason to be coy there. What, what is your assumption? Real, real quick, well, he was <laughs> alluding to a, a story when I was – in the state house, I was running for re-election one year and I was going house to house and knocked on someone's door and uh, they said, oh yeah, you come around every time. Uh, I've always had your sign in my yard. I've voted for you in the past. I vote for every Republican on the ticket. I said, well, I'm a Democrat. He said, you're a Democrat? Well, I don't vote for any Democrats. <laughs> this guy, he lived over on Merchants Road, corner of Merchants and Willowit, I think. Uh, and he said, <laughs> I said, who, he, then he finally said, who are you running against? And I told him, he said, you're running against a woman? Well, I can't vote for a woman. I'll vote for you. <laughs> and so so uh, there's some misogyny there that Charles and I were talking about. Yeah. Um, and But that was 30-something you know, years ago. It was uh, a real so, factor in politics. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's, it's just a reality to be acknowledged. It doesn't say we should be doing anything different but we just have to be aware of that. It really only comes into play in a, a thing like this where all the misogynists are out. I mean, yeah. every single misogynist voted uh, in this election. Um, yeah, and Jane George's race may, you know, of course that's a factor there too. Uh, another one where it, it seemed like there was, uh, you know, hearing, hearing Jane speak, like she's a great campaigner, really yeah. gave some great stump speeches that I heard while she was out there and had some capability to motivate uh, some voters there. Um, of course, swimming upstream in the district for the, for the race that she ran, but ran a good race, was visible, a good candidate, but still, I think we, what were the numbers with her race? It was similar with that 35, 65 yeah, they, split, wasn't it? About a, a two to one. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Senate District 6 has about the same proportion of Democrats and Republicans as Knox County as a whole. Hmm. Um, so uh, this is really getting to be uh, on us as a county party. Um, we have Democrats that aren't voting. Well, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about that. Having been the only Democrat elected to the state Senate and uh, you know, 40 years, 40 or 50 years, and only Democrat reelected to the state Senate in 70 years. Um, this year was so different because you can't even go house to house. It was you, with uh, the, the pandemic, you can't, the only, only way I got elected was going house to house. I didn't have any money, uh, but I did have the enough energy to go house to house and just outwork everybody. Um, you know, we had some excellent candidates. Elizabeth Rowland is one of the better candidates that, that you can think of. And, uh, you know, her dad and I, uh, served in the state house together and the way both of us got elected was going house to house. But in this pandemic, you couldn't go house to house. Um, so it's, this was just such a, a different year. 
Um, I hope our candidates don't get discouraged because the, they, they, they are out, outstanding. I thought they were, I thought we had some excellent, excellent candidates. Yes. Absolutely we did. Um, but I mean, that's, that's sort of where I think uh, county parties come in because the time, the time frame between you becoming a candidate and election day, it's nowhere big enough to talk to everybody that needs to be talked to. And that's where precinct chairs and district reps and the county party comes in because we really need to be making these relationships and having these contacts and curating these contacts so that when candidates come on, you know, they and start working, they've got a whole bunch of people that they can talk to all at once and are already, you, you've built the relationships, it's not transactional. Um, and that's the sort of work that needs to be going on at county parties um, across the state, across the country. And certainly we've been trying to get that going here in Knox County. And I'll, uh, I'll speak to that over here in my neck of the woods, Charles, some of the work that we did over near uh, Richard Yokely School District uh, maybe paid off back in 2017, 2018 when we were doing that because that district did, that precinct did flip to blue. Uh, and it had been lightly red, but flippable, as, as you were pointing out at that time, which is why we directed those efforts into it with some, uh, you know, campaigning out in some really inhospitable weather. But we kept it up for a, a long uh, for a steady period of time. Who's to say that we didn't build some inroads there that actually helped to do that, that prepared some of the ground for these candidates uh, to do that? Because in the president and I'm just speaking in the presidential uh, numbers there from what I just saw from our county chair. Uh, that precinct and uh, did flip, and then we saw a big flip, uh, a, a large swing up in Fountain City. That may be a more, you know, endemic demographic sort of change there uh, with with the presidential election. But I, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and attribute a little bit of those gains to the work that was done out in this uh, in this. Uh, well, that makes a huge difference. That York. kind of work makes a huge difference. And one of the things that we see in the data. Um, if you call somebody at the beginning of an election cycle, um, you know, like right around when uh, uh, your, your petition uh, deadline is February, they're still activated through through August and November. Hmm. Uh, and uh, compared to people that you don't call, and they, you know, they they're they're uh, a significant uh, less likely to go vote. You get about a twenty five percent boost uh, for the relatively small samples that we've been able to do. This year is going to be unique again because uh, the coordinated campaign that uh, uh, Rene Oyos was running um, is supposed to be repatriating all the data uh, that they generated from all these telephone calls. And so we should be able to, to on a large scale, see what the effectiveness of phone calling is. Um, you know, phone calls are second to door knocking, but they're not a distant second. They're a very close second to door knocking. And especially in this sort of thing year, like this year, uh, I think phone calls were every bit as effective as door knocking right. this year. Yeah. We'll find out. We don't know yet. We'll have to see the data. Let's talk about a few more races here. Uh, we've got, uh, several things to cover in the, about the 10 minutes that we've got left. Um, Talk about one of the candidates you mentioned just a minute ago, uh, Bill, uh, Elizabeth Rowland. Uh, put together a great race, great candidate. Uh, you know, uh, still looked at some of those same margins. Uh, now we've got a candidate there that she was up against and that was pretty well recognized. Uh, Karen Jurd run on had been on county commission for several years, well known and, and uh, a resident of, of that area in Fountain City for a long time. Uh, in a what had been a pretty Republican district for a long time, following up a uh, you know a very well known and long term incumbent that happened to leave the seat. Uh, what are the thoughts about that one? And it, are there real inroads for a Democratic candidate in that area in the next few cycles that we see? I think there are, uh, and I, I'm like I say, I hope Elizabeth stays involved and in Virginia. And Jane, uh, I just I I was very impressed with all three of them, uh, and and then I think they can build, and we can the Democratic Party in Knox County can build on what they've done 
but let's keep them involved and let's let's have some sort of debriefing with them to uh, find out what what they thought were the main issues in their race and 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 what they thought of the main issues for their districts and how how do we build on what they've done um, they're by by running they will have more knowledge of those districts than anyone else and run you know sometimes I know for myself I know I, I always learned a lot more from when I lost races than when I won races so uh, let's talk with Elizabeth and Jane and Virginia and uh, and get Matt and some other you know Gloria and Sam and get get Knox County Democrats together and uh, have have a debriefing and see what we, what we can do to build on it because we've got a real opportunity here. Things are changing. The entire South is changing. We're going to get into talking a little bit about the national races right now, and I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to win president and vice president. Uh, I've known Joe Biden since 1975, 76. Uh, I'm very happy that he he won. I was happy to endorse him, one of the, the first endorsers. Uh, and uh, Sylvia Woods and I endorsed him from around here, and we we worked with the campaign. Mark uh, Mark Siegel uh, kind of led the effort around here. Uh, John Bostet, Doug Vim, uh, all of us were working as hard as we could to try to try to help Joe Biden. He, you know, we didn't he didn't carry Knox County, but uh, I ran certainly a lot better than Hillary did, so I think we've got a we we've got an opportunity in the over the next few years to build uh, on what's what we've done in the past, what our good candidates did this year, and let's 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 keep it up. We there's there's great opportunity here. Definitely, and and uh, as far as the numbers go, things that we have learned this year. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, 2024 uh, is going to be a thing uh, when 16 comes up, or actually, those are state house, so they're every two years. Uh, county Commission 3, we have a clear majority there. We have to win County Commission 3. Uh, as far as state houses, um, 89 is actually closer to being Democratic than uh, 16 by just a smidge. Uh, so, you know, the candidate will come into the, the calculation there. Uh, Kerry Keeling uh, did a, a good job deciding to run as a write-in, but write-in candidates are just, they're, they're hard, too hard. They're too hard for what we're trying to do. Um, we need to get somebody in 89 if we, we can. Uh, hopefully Kerry will consider doing it again. Um, uh, Elizabeth Rowland, excellent candidate. Uh, well, now rem remember, remember the, they'll be redistricting. Yes. And what the Republicans have done all this time, I mean, even long, long ago, they divide Knox County up in the, for legislative seats, they divide it up in a pie shape where they split up the Democratic vote as much as possible. Right. So no district has more than yeah. 25, 30% yeah. yeah. Democrats. And definitely one of the consequences of these, these elections with the, with the state, but. Redistricting uh, is a thing. Um, but looking at these, the, the numbers that we got from this election, the gerrymander in Knox County is not that bad. We've got clear majorities in uh, five, uh, three of seven uh, House seats, one of three Senate seats, uh, five, five of nine, a majority of the county commission seats. And I hope they're not listening to this so they don't uh, fix that. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, that's actually, there is a majority of Republicans in Knox County. It's a slim one, uh, and it's a single uh, representative, so it's, it's not inherently unfair. The Democrats, we're doing this to ourselves by allowing this, uh, it's, there's no point of going to go vote because you're going to lose anyhow mentality. Keep us down. We're keeping that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, we should have won 18. It was not... It was not the candidate's fault. Um, it's uh, the blame gets spread fairly evenly uh, to the uh, across the county party because we just haven't known what to do. We're figuring stuff out. We're getting better, and we need to, to we need to to dig deep. Yeah, and, do you want to get to 
to a couple more uh, races here. We got about four and a half minutes here left, so we haven't talked about the Oyos race. Uh, another very important one. Excellent candidate. Uh, again, one of those that, that I chalk up to like the same sort of feeling after, uh, you know, with Elizabeth's race and with Virginia's race. Uh, why not Renee? You know, why won't why why can't we get that talented person into that seat? And again, it's just uh, attributed to, like why weren't there? Well, I think a lot of people were a little disappointed in that there wasn't a bigger gain. But I think from her last run against Burchett, but I think it's the same issue that we're seeing again, right? It's this massive turnout of of Republican votes here, and that maintenance is progress, right? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I think. East Tennessee uh, is the the electorate is mostly driven by what's known as the Michigan model, where your politics are part of your identity and it does not change quick. Right. I don't. There are some swing voters, but they're not the dominant factor. Yeah. Um, Bill, what do you think? Well, I think two things. Historically, Knox County has been Republican because of the Civil War. You go all the way back to the Civil War and Knox, East Tennessee sided with the Union, thankfully. Um, we won the Civil War. The United States of America won the Civil War. And, you know, it, it took the Democratic Party a long time to figure that, that out and to come on board. Um, but we, we now are more the party of Lincoln than the Republicans are. The Republicans seem to be uh, going the going backwards um, <laughs> yeah, Gary Willis, and Davis now yeah Gary Willis said that uh, East Tennessee didn't join the Confederacy until 1954 um, <laughs> so in part we suffer from the uh, just the institutional re Republicanism from here in East Tennessee who are most of these historic Republicans are not the rabid rat right-wing Republicans that you see in other parts of the country, uh, you know, anyway, I won't get into personalities, but uh, they, a lot of people vote Republican because of history. And then you have a lot of new people moving in who are the radical right wing Republicans. And so we we, we suffered doubly from that. I think we've got to go hard on our issues, uh, on our climate change issues, on our, uh, who you love is your own business and nobody else's uh, issues uh, on our education issues on uh, on our personal choice issues. Right. We've, we've right. got to give people uh, a reason to vote for Democrats. And in many cases, we haven't done that. Yeah. And there, if there's anything that we have learned out of this election nationwide and right here in Knox County, just raising money alone doesn't even do that. We right. have to figure out how to get that message really driven home. Uh, and, you know, from because we've had some amazing fundraising efforts from the county party and individual candidates. The Jamie, the the the, the uh, race over in South Carolina for Senate is the best demonstration of that that I can think of. Right. Jamie Harrison versus Sessions. I like, spent raised and spent oodles of money still didn't come up with the win. So it's got to be more than that. We've got to come up with the right message. A lot of what I hear from people is like that it's just, it's about that, about the way the message is presented. We know we're right. We got to figure out a way to really drive it home and get it into people. We got 30 seconds left. What, what else can we say? Build relationships. Get the message by building the relationship. If you build a relationship, you get a lot of leeway for, for messaging. Right. I think we, I think we built some. Let's celebrate Kamala Harris. Joe Biden, president and vice president, not in that order. <laughs> but, uh, let's, let's hope we get to honestly gonna, celebrate that. Very Pennsylvania, very Nevada, Georgia, Arizona, we're all going to come through. I, I definitely hope so. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be watching the the old telly tonight to see how that shakes out, and I'm sure y'all will as well. But thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Charles Chandler, Bill Owen. Thanks a lot. It's been a great discussion. I wish we had another 30 minutes to talk it all out, but because uh, I'm sure that we could <laughs> fill that up as well. Really good. But, you know, don't all get right. Me. Thank you all so much. I'm Michael Davis, and you've been watching DTV.